Human infants are among the most helpless of babies. How do they begin to be masters of themselves? And what happens when our systems are invaded by toxins and our bodies rage out of control? Robert is only moments from being launched into the outside world. That's it. Good morning. Breathe. Uh, Done uh, well done. Uh, Keep breathing. Keep breathing. Uh, Robert, come on. For the past nine months, he's been nurtured in his mother's womb. All his needs have been met by his mother through his umbilical cord. Now his body will have to fend for itself. But one vital organ is still far from complete. Like all babies, Robert is about to be born with only half a brain. What seems like a defect is actually Robert's greatest asset. Because the human brain is unformed at birth, it is shaped by our experience in the outside world. It is this that enables us to develop a thinking machine more powerful than any other on Earth. The downside is that for the first few weeks of life, Robert has no conscious control over his own body. The part of his brain that should give him that control is incomplete. The outer layer, his cerebral cortex. Although it contains more brain cells than Robert will ever need, 50 billion of them, the cells are isolated. What's missing are the connections between them. But remarkably, they have already begun to sprout thin tendrils, seeking to make contact with other cells nearby. In the meantime, the control of Robert's body lies with another part of his brain. Buried deep beneath the cortex is Robert's primitive brain. Unlike the cortex, it is already hardwired. Electrical impulses fire along millions of connections, each carrying a specific instruction. None of these impulses require conscious thought. When Robert's body needs food, his primitive brain activates an automatic survival mechanism. Broadcasting his need to the outside world. Oh, dear. 
Robert's primitive brain is doing more than just ordering a meal. His own immune system is not yet up and running. Each time he feeds, his blood gets a boost of antibodies to protect him against disease. What's more, these antibodies are uniquely tailored to his needs. When Robert's mother kisses him, she picks up any germs on his skin. Her body makes antibodies designed to fight them and she passes them on to Robert with his next meal. Good night. Unlike his father, Robert has very little insulating fat beneath his skin. Heat just pours out of his tiny body. In the warmth of the womb, this wasn't a problem. But now he's very vulnerable to cold. To combat this, Robert has his own built-in central heating system, usually only found in hibernating mammals. When Robert's skin temperature drops, a thermostat in his primitive brain registers the change and fires signals deep inside his body. These signals arrive in dense stores of specialized fat cells. Once triggered, they start to burn fat to generate heat. So Robert is able to maintain his core body temperature. It'll take a year for the fat cells to run out of fuel. But by that time, he'll be better insulated. Robert's primitive brain does a good job of keeping him alive. But it's hopeless at learning. Its hardwiring makes it rigid and inflexible. Complex skills are way beyond it. The cortex, on the other hand, is a blank sheet just waiting to be filled with new skills and behaviors. That'll be granny. I'll get it. At the moment, it still has some way to go. At his age, it can't even make sense of what he sees. His eyes turn light into electrical signals. But it's his cortex that translates these signals into an image. And since most of the connections are missing, the full picture isn't getting through. So Robert's view of the world is pretty weird. His brain can't combine the images from both his eyes. There are no distinct colors or shapes. So it isn't clear where one object ends and another begins. Gorgeous, sweetheart. Now, who wants a cup of tea? Oh, yes, please, darling. And it isn't just his eyesight. All of Robert's senses are in chaos. He's so firm, isn't he? So strong. There we are. Hello. Strong signals from his ear spill over into his vision. So any sudden noise Tim. is seen as well as heard. There we are. Oh, gee, good. You are lovely. The one thing he can recognize is the shape of a human face. And that's because it's an instinct pre-programmed into his primitive brain. Right. 
Before it can make sense of the world, Robert's cortex needs to master the basics. Tony, would you mind taking both? Because I'm going to go to the shop, so I'm just going to find my keys. Fortunately for Robert, his primitive brain comes with a built-in training program. Its reflexes force him to look at things that will improve his vision. Not such a great move, though, was it? But... Such as a chessboard. A bold, regular pattern generates strong, regular signals. Strong signals reinforce connections, making them permanent. Where there's no signal, the tendril breaks off and goes in search of a better connection to make. Another reflex makes Robert turn to look at anything passing in front of him. Bobby, you like that, Bobby? You like the colors? Improving his ability to see moving objects. Through trial and error, Robert's cortex is constantly rewiring itself, learning to recognize and understand the world around him. Right, young Bobby. Let's have a look at a gambit from the young Casper. He's only three weeks old, but Robert's cortex is already taking shape. Soon, he'll discover that he has a mind of his own. Robert's primitive brain has only one way of communicating with the outside world. For six weeks, this instinct has guaranteed his survival. But now he needs to expand his repertoire. As Robert's cerebral cortex grows, he is able to start learning from experience. Robert doesn't mean to smile. Hey, Lewis. Okay, cheerio. I think he's just smiled. Did you smile then? But his little grimace earns a surprising response. Boy, did you just smile? Did you give a good smile to Daddy? Oh, yes, Bobby. you did. And the more he yes. smiles, the more know. attention he gets. Sweetie. Yes. Robert is learning a new way to communicate. <laughs> so far, Robert's cortex has been growing steadily. But something remarkable is about to happen. The building blocks are in place. A whole new world is opening up to him. But the more information that comes into his brain, the more brain power Robert needs to handle it. The connections he has just aren't enough. The growth of his brain accelerates exponentially. Robert's cortex is making nearly two million connections every second. Every single thing that Robert sees and hears is shaping his brain. It will grow faster in the next few weeks than at any other time in his life. It is growing so fast, there's no more room inside his skull. So it starts to crumple up to fit more cortex into the same space.
forming the characteristic wrinkles of the human brain. Hi, Susie. Hello, oh, sorry we're a bit late. You didn't know what to wear. <laughs> I'm fine, mate. How are you? Good I'm to fine. see you. You look really well. Despite the massive growth in Robert's cortex, he's still dominated by the reflexes of the primitive brain. Such as the instinct to turn and look at anything passing in front of him. But now, his cortex is powerful enough to rebel. A signal is fired along a new connection, reaching down into the primitive brain, where it jams the signal controlling the reflex. For a moment, Robert's gaze is stuck. But with the reflex turned off, Robert's cortex seizes its moment and takes control. To the outside world, nothing has changed. But from now on, every time Robert turns his head, Hello, sweetie, you all right? Yeah. It's because he wants to. Some instincts of the primitive brain never completely go away. But as long as Robert's cortex keeps firing its signals, the turning reflex will stay suppressed for the rest of his life. Choosing what he looks at is one thing. Getting hold of it is another. Trying to coordinate what he sees with controlling his hand is an extremely difficult task. But Robert's cortex has been preparing for this challenge. It has vastly overgrown the number of connections it actually needs, allowing him to test billions of alternative pathways for every action he takes. Now, a process of elimination begins. Whenever Robert gets close, the best connections carry the strongest signals and survive. Those connections carrying no signals begin to wither and die. Robert's cortex is pruning itself into the most efficient structure. It takes time, and it can be frustrating. But Robert is building a powerful tool, which will last for the rest of his life. There we are, Bobby. We're going for a walk. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. All right, monkey. Only four weeks later, and Robert is close to getting what he wants. The redundant connections in his cortex have been pruned away. Now the final touches are being added. Specialized cells called glial cells are busy coating the strongest connections with a layer of fat. These fatty sheaths insulate the signals, improving their efficiency. When Robert reaches out, strong signals fire along the optimum pathways.
directing his hand precisely where he wants it to go. This tiny grasp is an enormous leap forward. Robert has started to take control of his domain. <laughs> All right. Robert has only just begun a journey of learning that will last his entire life. The process of rewiring in his cortex will slow down, but even when he's 90, it will still be forging new connections and being shaped by the world around him. Phoebe Hamilton's body has built-in protection against the outside world. It's a rabbit's foot. For luck. Her immune system is designed to react to anything that gets under her skin. So what brings you to Florida? My wife. I'm here to see a friend. Boyfriend? No, not exactly. So when's the wedding? Oh, no, no, no. I, uh, I haven't seen him since I left college. Is that so? But the system can fail. And when it goes wrong, the effects can be disastrous as Phoebe, in the next two weeks, is going to find out. Hey, this is your captain speaking. Welcome to Florida, a place we call paradise on Earth. We wish you a safe and happy stay. Hi, Phoebe. What? I know, I've changed, right? Phoebe's immune system is about to be called into action. Oh my god, what is that? That is a wasp. It's enormous. Yeah, it's pretty big. She has never encountered an American wasp before. The wasp pumps venom into her skin. Within seconds, the venom starts to kill her skin cells and trigger pain nerves. Ow. Are you serious? Are you okay? Yeah, it's nothing. It's, it's fine. Let's go. It's time for Phoebe's body to fight back. Throughout her skin are specialized immune cells called mast cells. Bathed in venom, they react discharging their contents, a chemical known as histamine. Histamine makes tiny blood vessels expand. Fluid leaks out, flooding the damaged area with the immune system's most powerful weapon, antibodies. But histamine also has unpleasant side effects. The buildup of fluid under Phoebe's skin makes it red, hot, and swollen. Ow! Oh, God, sorry. Now the search is on to find an antibody against wasp venom. Phoebe's bloodstream is full of antibodies, each one tailor-made to fight a specific invader. The antibodies in her blood tell the story of her life. This one protects Phoebe against a virus she caught when she was three. This one is for a bacteria Phoebe encountered when she was 10. Phoebe even has antibodies against food. 
These don't stop food from being nutritious, but her body makes them because it sees any foreign object, even an apple, as a potential killer. John! <laughs> but because Phoebe has never been stung by a wasp before, she has no antibodies in her blood against its venom. Instead, her body must make them from scratch. Here we are. Hope you're hungry. Mm. I've never had shark before. Isn't it delish? I mean, don't you find it delish? Remember how you used to say that? I never said delish. You did so. <laughs> A remarkable process is beginning back in Phoebe's skin. The wasp venom brings dormant cells, called dendritic cells, to life. These cells have a mission, to carry samples of venom to the core of the immune system where antibodies are made. But it's a complex process that will take several days. How are you feeling? It's a bit better. You know, Maybe we should put some ice on it. No, it's fine. So, um, have you rented this beach house for the whole summer? Mm-hmm. A whole crowd of you? Yeah, well, the others come down when they feel like it. And who's down there at the moment? Well, at the moment, just me. Fine, Spike. Phoebe's antibodies are meant to protect her, but sometimes her immune system makes the wrong type of antibody, which can do her more harm than good. I just know you two are going to get along. <laughs> like wasp venom, tiny fragments of dog hair invade Phoebe's body. This oh, time, kisses. through her kisses nose. Kisses for your daddy. Kisses for your daddy. Here, you want to feed him? This isn't the first time Phoebe has been exposed to dog hair, so she has already made antibodies against it. Good boy. But unfortunately for Phoebe, she's made the wrong type. They are called E antibodies. And unlike regular antibodies, they cling to mast cells which guard the lining of her nose. They're going to bring Phoebe nothing but trouble. Can you get inside? I think he really likes you. E antibodies aren't meant for tiny invaders like fragments of dog hair. Not bad, huh? They are intended for much larger intruders parasites like tapeworms and ticks. They trigger a dramatic chain reaction designed to blast parasites away. As dog hair locks onto E antibodies, Phoebe's mast cells erupt and pour out their histamine. the blood vessels in Phoebe's nose start to leak. The fluid escapes as a wave of surplus mucus, which would wash any parasites away. But there are no parasites in Phoebe's nose. Instead, E antibodies are giving Phoebe an allergy. Why some people develop allergies and others don't isn't fully understood. But the seeds are sown in childhood. Hey. 
As young children, all of us have a tendency to make E antibodies. Then through exposure to infections, our immune systems learn how to make regular antibodies instead. But Phoebe was overprotected from dirt and disease. So her immune system never fully made the switch. Get down. She still has a tendency to make E antibodies. Phoebe is not alone. Half the population of Europe and America have some sort of allergy. Twenty-four hours after Phoebe was stung by the wasp, there's little sign of damage. But her body is already preparing for its next encounter with wasp venom. The dendritic cells carrying venom have reached a gland in her armpit. They construct a filter designed to intercept cells which can manufacture antibodies. Morning. Morning. Still the same old crazy Phoebe. Couldn't wait to experience the great outdoors, huh? Mm. Spike, where are your manners? Go say good morning. No, please. Just stay away. I'm allergic to him. You're kidding. I'm sorry, I thought it would pass. It's just... It's no problem. He can stay outside and we can stay inside. Well, it's not like it'll rain forever. Spike loves Scramble. Action. Double word score. Inside the gland in Phoebe's armpit, an immune cell called a B cell is trapped it reacts to the wasp venom and starts to clone itself, each clone capable of producing antibodies against wasp venom. The B cell should make regular antibodies. But as the first one springs into action, it's clear they've made a disastrous error. They've mistaken the venom for a parasite. They make E antibodies, antibodies which will make Phoebe allergic to wasps. Phoebe's immune system has gone into overdrive. Every second, each B cell clone spews out over 2,000 E antibodies against wasp venom. The E antibodies lock onto mast cells all over Phoebe's body. When they reach a critical level, she'll be allergic to wasps. Phoebe's mast cells are turning into ticking time bombs. Phoebe, don't move. Who needs 
loads of rabbits, but... Sun's out. I didn't get stung. Maybe my luck's about to change. Phoebe may think that all her troubles are behind her, but things are about to take a turn for the worse. Her mast cells are being called into action again, this time by the sun's ultraviolet rays. Ultraviolet rays penetrate her skin, killing some of its cells. Sensing a threat, Phoebe's mast cells erupt releasing histamine to summon antibodies. As a result, after just 10 minutes in the sun, Phoebe's skin is becoming inflamed. Hey, Phoebe, maybe you should get out of the sun. Maybe you're just worried I might be a natural. Oh, yeah? Twenty-four hours later, Phoebe is burning up, and it's all because of histamine. The fluid that is built up under her skin is irritating nerve endings, making her incredibly tender. Hey, I thought maybe we can go snorkeling today. Are you joking? Look at me. I did warn you, didn't I? Come on. You come on. You didn't come all this way just to sit around, did you? I'm beginning to wonder why I came here at all. My life has been made of misery. A dog in a napkin. Don't insult my dog. Your bloody dog tore up my rabbit's foot. Oh, loosen up, Phoebe. Oh, you've really changed. Yeah. I was hoping you had, too. Phoebe's burnt skin is already beginning to heal. But beneath its surface, trouble is brewing. E antibodies on her mast cells have reached a critical level. Phoebe is allergic to wasps. If she's stung now, her symptoms will be totally different from the last time. This is ridiculous. You're right, I didn't come all this way just to sit around. Okay, I know a place. Cool, shady, no, no, no dogs or wasps. <laughs> How do you like your shark? Medium or well done? Is this right, shark? I would love it. Oh, bloody wolf! Following me! Careful, Phoebe, you're gonna aggravate him. Well, it's aggravating me! Once again, wasp venom floods into Phoebe's skin. But thanks to E antibodies, her mast cells are now a thousand times more sensitive than the last time she was stung. She's about to experience the most extreme allergic reaction possible, known as anaphylactic shock. In just a fraction of a second, thousands of mast cells around the sting erupt. Even worse, tiny traces of venom surge through her bloodstream and trigger millions more. Fluid pours out of her blood cells throughout her skin. It's as if she's been stung all over. Doesn't look that bad. It feels really bad. 
The fluid leaking out of her blood activates nerve endings that make her itch. It's a response designed to get her to scratch off a parasite, but now it's out of control. So much fluid has been lost from her bloodstream into her skin that her blood pressure plummets. She starts to feel faint. Now, Phoebe can't breathe properly because high levels of histamine make her airways close down. In a desperate attempt to save her, her body releases an antidote to histamine, adrenaline. Adrenaline makes Phoebe's blood vessels contract and stops them from leaking. It also makes her airways open up. I think he's passing. But Phoebe's respite is short-lived. There are still traces of venom in her blood, finding new mast cells to trigger. Oh my god, 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 oh my god. Phoebe's blood pressure has been cut in half. Her heart beats faster, trying to pump blood around her body. But it's fighting a losing battle. If she isn't treated within the next five minutes, she'll die. Phoebe. Phoebe, I hope you have insurance. Phoebe, when? Phoebe, can you hear me? I don't know, half hour ago? Is she allergic? I don't think she's allergic to wasps. You know, she was okay when she got stung before. Can you take your blood pressure? I'll put some oxygen on you, Phoebe. Okay. You're gonna be all right. BP? 60 over 40. Okay, epi, 0.3. Just breathe in and out nice. The doctor's prescription is the same as her body's, adrenaline but at a quantity 30 times greater than Phoebe can produce. Again, adrenaline races through her bloodstream. But this time, there's enough to stop the effects of histamine for good. Within minutes, Phoebe has been brought back from the brink of death. Don't worry, Phoebe, you're in hospital. But in case she's ever stung again, she'll have to carry adrenaline with her. You're gonna be fine. For the rest of her life. You had us worry for a minute there, Phoebe. Sorry. I have got medical insurance. You heard that? Well, I guess you'll be glad to go home. Oh, you haven't got rid of me yet. I've still got four days left. We uh, still have time to go on that snorkeling trip. Hmm. Yeah. Spike loves snorkeling. Ha, ha, ha.